In this lecture, you'll learn about Flash Pool. Like Flash Cache, Flash Pool is an ONTAP virtual storage tiering technology which helps improve the performance of your cluster. You saw in the last lecture that Flash Cache is a PCI Express card with memory on board that you fit into your controller, which increases the size of the system memory cache. Flash Pool works differently. Flash Pool is an aggregate that is made up of HDDs or spinning disks, and they are fronted by a cache of SSD drives, which improves the performance for that aggregate. The SSD drives do not increase the size of the aggregate. They're used as a cache only. So taking the aggregate in the diagram here, I have got three spinning disk RAID groups. Let's say that in total, each of these RAID groups, just to make the numbers really easy, is one terabyte. And then I add SSDs in front of that as a cache in front of my spinning disks. And let's say that these are each 500 gigabytes. So I've got one terabyte, one terabyte, one terabyte. So three terabytes of spinning disks and 500 gig and 500 gig, one terabyte of my SSDs. The size of this aggregate is not four terabytes. It is three terabytes. So the SSDs are used as a cache only. They do not add to the usable capacity of that aggregate. Now, I know I was using lower numbers when I was showing in the diagram there, just to make the numbers really easy to count and make it easy to understand. Okay, moving on. So flash pool random read caching. Random reads from the aggregate are cached on the SSDs as this gives large performance gains. Sequential reads are not cached as the HDDs with spinning disks already provide relatively good performance. We spoke about that earlier in this section. Data being evicted from system memory that has been marked to be cached will be written into the flash pool's SSD cache at the next consistency point rather than going to the spinning disks. So looking at an example here, and it's the same one as we've been using earlier on in the section. So we've got aggregate one, which is owned by controller one. And I can see that there has been activity on the aggregate because we have got data, which is in the system memory that will have come in from reads and writes going to the system. Then a client sends in a read request for purple data. What the controller will do is it will check first if that is in system memory. It's not, so it will fetch it from disk, and it's currently on the spinning disks, the HDDs in aggregate one. So it will fetch it from there. As usual, that goes into the top slot in system memory and will then be sent back out to the client. Just before that happened, you saw that in system memory, we had the yellow, gray, red, and green data. Then when the data is read from the disk, it goes into the top slot in system memory. Everything else gets bumped down a slot. Now, previously, it was the green data that was in the bottom slot in system memory. And let's say that that was randomly read data. So that is a good candidate to be cached on the SSDs. And it has been marked by the system to be cached. At the next consistency point, that will be written to the SSDs which are being used as the cache at the front of the aggregate. The block that was read now exists on both HDD and SSD in the flash pool. I'll just go back a slide again. So this green data, when it was in system memory, well, to get into system memory, it was read from the HDDs. When it then gets written to the SSDs in the next consistency point, that green data is on both the SSDs and it is on the HDDs as well. The block that is sent to the flash pool is a copy of the block that exists on the HDDs. Random overwrite caching. So a random overwrite is defined as the same data block that is randomly written more than once. The first random write is sent to HDD. 
then random overwrites which are performance intensive for our HDDs will be sent to the SSD instead of to the HDD storage if their block size is 16 kilobytes or smaller because that's going to give us the best usage of the SSDs. The earlier written block on HDD will be marked invalid. So what's happened here is there was a, the initial random write and that was written to HDD. Then there is a new random overwrite of that. So that's going to be overwritten with some new different data that will be written to the SSDs because it's new data which is different the data which is on the hdds is not valid anymore it's been changed since then so it's going to be marked as invalid and it is the data on the ssds which is marked as the good up-to-date copy sequential reads or random writes with a block size larger than 16 kilobytes will be sent to hdd we've only got so much capacity on those ssds which give us the great performance so we want to optimize the use of that capacity just put the data on there which is going to give us the biggest boost unlike cached reads the blocks that are cached as random overwrites are only on the aggregates ssd cache so the hdd We'll have an old copy there, but the new current copy of the data is only on the SSD. It's not written to the aggregates HDD yet. The flash pool keeps track of all read and write data that has been cached in the SSDs and determines which data is most used. Again, we want to make the most efficient use of that available space. Data that is less frequently used becomes eligible for ejection from the cache as the cache becomes full. Writes that are evicted from cache are moved to HDD because obviously we still need to keep the copy of the data. Reads make way for higher priority data. The block is already on HDD, so no transfer is necessary. So let's look at how the eviction works. So we want to keep the, the best data that's going to get the best performance boost on the HDDs. So that is going to be our random reads and overwrites, which are recent. So the flash pool eviction scanner starts to run when the SSD cache is 75% full. There's no point in kicking data out of there if it's only 25% full. There'd be no reason to do that. We only need to change it when there's no more space left. So when the the SSDs are getting full, we don't have space for everything on there. We want to keep the best data there. We're going to start moving the old data off to make more room for the newer data. So the way that the eviction scanner works is it's like a ladder. You can see here we've got a ladder with rungs going from the hot on the left to cold and then finally evicting on the right. Now, when data first goes into the cache it is it goes in the middle here and it's given a level of neutral the eviction scanner works on a particular time period so at fixed intervals it's going to do a scan and see what has changed if during the last time period the data has been read then it moves up a rung on the ladder so it goes if it was neutral now and it's been read during the last period of the scanner it moves up a spot to warm then over the next time interval if it's been read again it's going to go up another spot again up to hot now, there's only so many rungs on the ladder so it's right up at the top of the ladder now and if it kept being read during each time interval it would stay there now, let's say that over the next time interval, that data has not been touched. Well, if that's the case, it's going to move down a rung. It's now back down to warm. Then over the next time interval of the scanner, again, it hasn't been touched, so it moves back down to neutral. Then the next time interval, again, it hasn't been touched. It's now cold. Then let's say over the next time interval, it actually has been touched again, so it's been read or overwritten. It will move back up a spot to neutral. Then over the next interval, not touched again, it goes down to cold. And then if over the next interval, it hasn't been touched again, well, it's now going to be evicted from the cache. So what kind of workloads are suitable for flash pool? Well, it's effective at caching random reads and offloading those from the hard drive 
Flashbool also benefits in offloading small random overwrites. So if you've got an application workload that consists mostly of random reads or writes, then that is going to benefit from Flashpool. Flashpool does not cache sequential operations because we already get relatively good performance for those from our HDDs, our spinning disks. So don't use Flashpool for workloads that are mostly sequential. It's not a suitable solution for those. And also, if you've got a small working data set, there's not a lot of data there, then it's likely that it can be served completely from system memory. System memory is already used first, and if that's big enough, then again, you don't really need to use Flashpool for that situation. Okay, let's talk about a comparison between Flash Cache and Flash Pool, the two VST virtual storage tiering technologies. Flash Cache and Flash Pool can both be enabled on the same system. So it's not an either or thing. You could have just Flash Cache, or you could use just Flash Pool, or you could use both. And any aggregate containing SSDs, it's Flash Pool, or a purely SSD aggregate will be excluded from flash cache because it would be you it would be wasteful if we cache the same blocks in both flash cache and flash pool flash cache and flash pool are a limited resource there's only so much capacity there we don't want to be putting the same data in both that would be wasteful we'll just use one or the other so we want to keep as much capacity here free as possible Eligible blocks for a flash pool aggregate will be cached on its SSDs. Non flash pool blocks can be cached in flash cache. Again, we're not going to cache in both. The system memory cache is always used first before flash cache and or flash pool. Blocks can be moved to flash cache or flash pool as they're aged out of system memory. Okay, so let's do that comparison now. So you saw this slide actually already in the last lecture when we did talk about flash cache. Flash cache is plug and play. It's that PCI Express card that you fit in the system. You just have to put it in and then that's really all that you need to do for it to work. It improves performance for random reads. So flash cache is memory based, RAM based, and it's not permanent storage. So you can't use it to cache writes because if you lose power, then the data is gone. So it can't, cannot cache writes on there. It improves your read performance only and specifically for random reads. It improves performance for all the aggregates on a controller. So flash cache is a controller level cache. And if there's an HA takeover, the cache is going to be lost. Again, as you saw in the last lecture. Let's look at flash pool now. So flash pool aggregates are configured by the storage administrator. So this is not just, you don't just fit it as plug and play, you're going to be explicitly configuring this. It improves performance for random reads and random overrides. The cache that is used in flash pool is SSD, which is permanent storage. So you can also use it to improve your write performance as well. It improves performance for selected aggregates. So flash cache works at the controller level, flash pool works at the aggregate level. You specify the particular aggregates that this is going to be configured for. So this is going to be targeted performance improvement. You're going to specify the workloads that this is for because you're going to put those workloads on your flash pool aggregates. And if there's an HA takeover, the cache is still there. When say that this flash pool is on controller one, and controller one fails and controller two takes over ownership. Well, controller, controller two takes ownership of the disks, which is the same disks which have got the cache on there. So the cache remains when you have an HA takeover. That's not the case with flash cache. Okay, so I'm not saying here that flash pool is better than flash cache. They have both got great things about them they both improve the performance and it, again it's not an either or thing you can use both and then you can get the benefits from both okay that was just about everything to tell you in this lecture one final thing is i wanted to give you an idea of the kind of benefits that you're going to get from caching so on the slide here this has got ballpark 
read latency figures for when the system is under up to 50% load. Now, this is a ballpark figures, okay? Don't take this as gospel. It's going to give you an idea of the kind of performance that you're going to get. But obviously, it depends on the particular hardware that you're using and also the workloads that you're running on that hardware as well. But in general, if you send in a read request to the system and it is served from system memory, the latency is going to be around about 0.1 milliseconds. If it's served from flash cache, so if the data is not in system memory and the system then looks in flash cache and finds it there, it can be served with about one milliseconds of latency. On an SSD aggregate, it's also around about one millisecond of latency. For a flash pool aggregate, it's around one to seven milliseconds of latency. Why there's the, the big spread there is because maybe it's served from SSD or maybe it's served from HDD if it's not in the cache. Hopefully you're, you're running a workload which is suitable for flash pool. So most of the time your reads are going to be served from the cache. So that's why it's going to be at the lower end there. And you're still going to get that really good one to seven milliseconds of latency. Next thing we could be using is a 15K RPM spinning hard disk. That will give around 7 to 11 milliseconds of latency, a 10K RPM spinning disk, 10 to 14 milliseconds, and 7.5K, 15 to 18 milliseconds. So that just gives you a kind of idea of the general kind of latency figures you're going to get, depending on what actual media type is being used to serve those reads. Okay, that was everything that I wanted to tell you here. See you in the next lecture. Thanks for watching. If you want to get hands on practice with NetApp Storage for free on your laptop, then you can download my free ebook, which you can see above my head right now. Also, check out my NetApp Storage Complete course, which will teach you everything you could possibly want to know about ONTAP. Thanks.